Ready to unleash your full potential and achieve greatness? Welcome to Inspirations for Your Life, the daily podcast that empowers you. Unlock hidden secrets of success with our powerful tips and techniques to help improve your life. Subscribe now and experience the transformation you've been waiting for. Join thousands of motivated listeners around the world on this life-changing journey. Don't wait. Subscribe to Inspirations for Your Life today at BelieveMeAchieve.com and click on the IFYL podcast. I'm John C. Morley, serial entrepreneur, and I can't wait for the next episode. Can you? This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE podcast. One that everybody wants me. Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. This is my idol. You're gonna acknowledge me. Welcome to the Monday Night Raw review. It's Tuesday, September 26th, 2023. We're gonna talk Monday Night Raw and all that happened last night in Ontario, California. A very important show as far as setting up the event for Fastlane the, the in the world title match for Fastlane with Shinsuke and Seth we also got a world tag team title match or an undisputed tag team title match between Kevin and Sammy and Judgment Day's Priest and Balor and uh, we got an appearance from Cody Rhodes a couple of them we'll talk about that we'll also talk about uh, the Jade Cargill signing the multi-year signing as well as uh, the release of bro Matt Riddle but before we get there we have a couple new patrons who have joined us over the last uh, couple days and I'd like to welcome Kevin Lyons and Smoke DZA so Kevin and Smoke welcome to the WWE podcast family and if you aren't able to access the discord server let me know because some of you when you first get on the uh On the member side of things, there's some issues or questions about getting access to Discord, so let me know. I'll be able to send that to you ASAP, so welcome. And if you want to get an ad-free experience, I know that's the number one complaint about this show, and uh, you can resolve that by going to patreon.com slash WWE podcast. We have free trials and free trials over at Apple as well. All righty, well... I'm going to start with something that I haven't gone really into depth about because it's been more speculative. But now that we've entered a a pattern of this storyline of Drew McIntyre slowly descending into a heel character, it's something that we can really sink our teeth into. I think we can definitively say that that is actually where they're going, a path of which I and many others agree with. I, I even did a poll on Spotify this past week, and I'm going to pull that up right now. I asked if Drew McIntyre, McIntyre should turn heel, and 86% of you said yes, 13% said no. So that is an overwhelming majority of those who, who participated in the Spotify poll. And, you know, again, not a large sample size, but it is something to go by of, hey, I think fans are ready for Drew to turn heel. Now, while I support this turn, I'm all for it. I think it's going to present a lot of fun options for Cody and for Seth down the line, who I think both will remain baby faces for the foreseeable future. Drew presents an awesome opponent for both. And I think that that is potentially where they're going. And I mean, it has to be right. You wouldn't just turn somebody heel if you didn't have a few people in mind that they could work with that would benefit all parties. So Drew turning heel. Good. Um, it's a slow turn. They're not immediately doing the the old Drew stabbed somebody in the back. What you know, he low blowed somebody, did something dastardly. They're taking more of a psychological approach with this one instead of an outright flat. This is exactly when he turned heel moment, and it's a different type of way to turn someone heel. I don't I don't think it's a wrong way. It's just non traditional. Typically, it's a singular moment uh, that 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 individual turns heel. In this case, it's a slow evolution of Drew descending into darkness where he doesn't help Jey Uso. And, uh, you know, of course, this past week where he doesn't 
help Kofi Kingston after Ivar, uh, Ivar rather, beat him down. And he's conflicted, but this time a little bit more passive about helping him. And uh, I have to say, I understand what they're doing. It's not the most insane logic in the world of how they're pursuing this slow burn heel turn for Drew. (laughs) But it's illogical. And the reason I say that, and here, here he goes, tearing down something so simple. No, it's not so simple. In fact, they want you to overlook these details that are massive here. Like, what the narrative is, pushed by Michael Cole even too, is that Drew should help out and that he's being selfish and only caring about himself, caring about victories and not helping out people when they're in need. That's essentially what they're doing. That's an awful narrative. If the people involved have caused, especially Jey Uso, have caused uh, hardship in Drew's life over the last several weeks or months. Case in point, Jey Uso was part of the faction that cost Drew McIntyre a chance to beat Roman Reigns at Clash of the Castle. And Drew, who has no obligation to Jey whatsoever, and... They aren't friends on camera. They're not even a tag team on camera. They have no obligation to one another. Same. I mean, it goes both ways here. And the fact that we're supposed to be angry or disappointed and frustrated with Drew for not helping a guy that was a part that took part in helping him lose or causing him to lose the match at Clash of the Castle, and and others, other times. We're supposed to feel that Drew has an obligation to help. Why? He doesn't need to be the moral overseer, like the, the moral overlord of the WWE. He's not Cody Rhodes. That, ro- that, that role's already filled. <laughs> Again, his name's Cody Rhodes. We already have a moral compass guiding us. We'll get to more on that in a minute. So I don't understand it. I mean, again, from just my own perspective, I'm like, no, I I totally get why Drew's doing what he's doing. Good for him. F you, bro. You know, after what you did to me, I don't have to help you. You know, we're a tag team just tonight and, uh, you know, that's it. Or or rather we, we have our match one-on-one. I beat you and, uh, you know, that's it. And I leave like they did last week. You know, we, we, we don't need to be friends. I'm not getting involved in, uh, and the beat downs here. I'm doing my own thing and good for you. And then this week, Kofi Kingston, who has been rubbing drew the wrong way for several weeks. Now, same with Xavier Woods. We have Kofi get uh, distracted by Ivar attacking woods on the outside, which leads to a claymore. Uh, well, that's on Kofi. Is it not? Is that, I mean, sure, you could say the same thing about Jay last week, but is it not on Kofi for his own unprofessionalism to not be distracted when you are in a match competing that you shouldn't take your eye off the ball and we're supposed to fault Drew for trying to win a match? Isn't that the purpose of why everyone's here is to win matches? At least that's what we're supposed to believe. Although if you, if Cody has anything to say about it, he's here just to make us happy and entertain us like a clown. But in reality, as fans, we want to believe that these men and women are here to win matches and win championships. So Drew didn't do anything underhanded. He didn't low blow. He didn't use a foreign object. Okay. He just took advantage of the situation. What's he supposed to do? What's he supposed to do? It would actually be a, 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 a referendum on Drew if he didn't take advantage and said, oh, well, I could beat him right here and get a victory and notch an, another win in my column. Or uh, I, could let, um, I could let Kofi get distracted and, and let the moment pass by just because I'm a good swell guy that has you know, a, an overachieving moral standard, right? It's just... It's, it's not reasonable, I don't think, for us to think that Drew should help these people that have caused him heartache 
over the last several weeks and months and even longer with Jey Uso and 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 Drew. So you know, I just don't understand it now. If it was somebody random that he had never interacted with and he he was a tag team partner, maybe Riddle. Uh, obviously, we'll, maybe we'll talk about that next. But if it was Riddle who was the one getting beat down after they formed some kind of loose friendship, they've never had an issue with one another, and Drew just turned his back and didn't help Riddle, that's more that's more logical. But this one does makes total sense. Would you help a guy that screwed you out of a championship opportunity because they're now getting beat down in the ring and now suddenly you're just magically obligated to help them? No, 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 no. That's not how that works. So I'm not, I don't, it, it, again, it's the, uh, it's the selection of who Drew is turning his back on, quote unquote, that I have a problem with. Not necessarily the method in which they're doing it. It's just the character selection, if, if you will. So I hope I didn't ruin it for you, but I guess that's partly my job here is to, to break things down into a fine powder or grind them down into a fine powder. So now as far as Matt Riddle goes, hey, you know, you, you kind of saw this coming. I'm not saying I did or, you know, that, oh my God, yep, he's going to be released in a couple days, but I'll say this. I'm not surprised. Okay. He has not exactly been a PR dream since he came to the WWE. He hasn't exactly, uh, you know, been a, uh, an asset and not a liability for the organization over the last several years with all of his outside extracurricular activities. And, um, I will say that, uh, there, there's a report out here now I'm looking on uh, a website, a wrestling website, very well known one. I'll just say what it is. No DQ. And uh, it says that a, a WWE announcer Booker T commented on Riddle's personal issues playing a role in the departure. And here is what he said, quote, there is only so much that is going to be tolerated. It catches up to you. You become a liability. It was not shocked. Or I was not surprised, not shocked or surprised that this happened. You put yourself in a position for something to happen nine times out of 10. It will happen. And that's true. I mean, uh, Matt Riddle is and has been a a bit of a liability. You can go and Google all the uh, outside antics he's been involved with. And it's not good, you know, not good. And they realize that uh, it's, you know, one too many chances and you got, you got, you got to go, bro. No pun intended. And it, you know, and one part of me realizes that he could have been a lot more. I wanted to see what a serious Matt Riddle all the time was instead of the jokey, you know, always kind of on the fringe about joking about being high all the time. A lot of kind of pot references, right? All that kind of stuff, which was, you know, at times is is funny, but it only gets funny until it's not, right? And the magic he was able to conjure up with Randy Orton was one that nobody saw coming. And it was one that generated a lot of cash for WWE with our rated RKO, um, or rather RK bro, excuse me with the t-shirts, everything else that went with it, all the merch and they were a hell of a tag team. So the one thing is now you can rule out Randy Orton kind of uh, reuniting with Matt Riddle. That's now out the window. At least we can eliminate that possibility of Randy's potential return scenario. It's more than likely now going to be involved with the bloodline and, and uh, Roman reigns. So that's a positive in my mind. So Hey, it's it's not a uh, it's not a good day for Matt Riddle, but as an organization, they did the smart thing. They just did. From a professional standpoint, it's disappointing because Riddle had a hell of a lot of talent. He was excellent in the ring, a legitimate badass, and I feel for him. But as a company, you got to do what you got to do and protect yourself at the end of the day. You just do. That sounds cold-hearted and callous, but what are you supposed to do, right? You 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 gave this guy a long leash, and he proved time after time, you know he may that he probably is going to be a liability for his career. And uh, hey, maybe they'll reunite someday. Maybe they will. I think more often than not, given he's what thirty seven years old, maybe they'll make amends in three, four, five years, something like that. All right, let's get to the signing. Jade Cargill, that's a name I haven't ever said uh, on the show at least 
maybe more than once. She signed with WWE. It's confirmed. It's not rumor. WWE themselves put this out. Multi-year deal. And I will say this. Let me say right off the bat. The amount of time that I have spent watching a a Jade Cargill match is the same amount of time I have spent uh, as a woman, which means uh, about zero. (laughs) So uh, I I just, I I haven't watched. uh, No, that's a little bit exaggerated. I have seen a little bit, a little bit of her stuff. She, from what I've seen and from the analysis of others that I trust, it doesn't seem like she's exactly ready for the WWE style and that she's got a million dollar look, but her in-ring performances have not kept up with how she looks. And that's the general consensus I get. And given that uh, going with that on face value, I think that she probably should spend a lot of time in the performance center. Now she can't spend forever. This is a big announcement. It's making shockwaves in WWE, right? But right now, I mean, I'm sure that they're in the training center seeing what she can and can't do, what she needs to work on. Uh, WWE izing her, taking all the bad habits of AEW out of her, her, uh, her wrestling, out of her mannerisms, out of her psychology, and, you know, force feeding whatever the WWE way of doing things is, you know. So I'm sure that that's a process. It takes time to kind of rewire someone's brain with the way things are done in WWE that are not done the same way in AEW. So there's that kind of uh, transition period. I would say that uh, at the latest, we'll see Jade Cargill probably debut at the Royal Rumble in the, in the Women's Royal Rumble. Uh, and at the earliest, Survivor Series. And that's my guess. I wouldn't rush it. She's got an amazing look. She's a million dollar look. I mean, she is just uh, in crazy shape. And people are already talking about the potential matchups of Jade Cargill and Bianca Belair and Jade Cargill and Charlotte, Jade Cargill and Rhea Ripley. And all of those on paper sound great. Okay, they do. But we're going purely, for most of us, on a how does it look? Because both women are super muscular. And you know what's interesting? We're kind of sneakily under the radar transforming the women's division or at least diversifying it more significantly in a, in a way that's not just the athleticism. It's not just about the gymnastic ability of the WWE uh, women's stars taking away that highly athletic, uh, you know, or, or rather overwhelmingly athletic style. They're starting to implement a lot more, powerhouse women and taking those powerhouse women and putting them in prominent positions, i.e. Rhea Ripley, who won the, uh, the championship at WrestleMania, uh, Raquel Rodriguez, who has been in uh, a couple of matches now with Rhea. We have uh, Bianca Belair, who kind of is an awesome mix of both, where she's ultra athletic, but also is a powerhouse so she's got a nice kind of dual-edged sword there, a switch hitter, if you will. You have Nia Jax. You have uh, Piper Niven. Um, you now have an incoming Jade Cargill, right? So there, and you, you have a lot of powerhouse women with a lot. Of, it's just, my point of all this saying is, it's just a nice way to kind of change up the types of matches that we see all the time, which has been and this is goes for the men's division as well. Just like a uh, an overwhelmingly athletic match, which don't get me wrong, I, I love that as much as the next person, but it's nice to see once in a while certain body types force a different match. It changes the the, the feel of the match because you know you're not going to get a flip flop and fly match. You're going to get a much slower power move matchup, and that's. Good. I, I like that. It, it kind of uh, changes the taste buds a little bit, right? You, you don't want to just keep eating the same food over and over, even if it's really good. Eventually, you get sick of it. You got to change it up, right? Like sweet and salty, right? So my point is, yes, this is. Good. I, I think it ultimately will be a good thing. 
they must have a lot of confidence in her if they're going to just, you know, sight unseen, sign her to a multi-year deal. Uh, I, I don't feel negative about this right now. I have no no reason to feel negative about it. I know some people do. But I'm, I'm going to take the positive train on this one. Believe it or not, right? Crazy. All right. I think it's time to give a little bit of love to the sponsor of today's episode. And then we'll be right back with more Monday Night Raw. Ready to unleash your full potential and achieve greatness? Welcome to Inspirations for Your Life, the daily podcast that empowers you. Unlock hidden secrets of success with our powerful tips and techniques to help improve your life. Subscribe now and experience the transformation you've been waiting for. Join thousands of motivated listeners around the world on this life-changing journey. Don't wait. Subscribe to Inspirations for Your Life today at BelieveMeAchieve.com and click on the IFYL podcast. I'm John C. Morley, serial entrepreneur, and I can't wait for the next episode. Can you? All right, let's get back into it here as we uh, trudge through Monday Night Raw. And, yeah, I got to say, I shouldn't say trudge. It's a little bit harsh. I, I enjoyed the show overall. I thought it was a nice a nice show, one that set up the Fastlane event very nicely, at least in some respects. And one of those respects was Seth Rollins and Shinsuke Nakamura. And let me just say that this continues to impress. I'm not sick of the Shinsuke Nakamura subtitled promos. I'm not at all. You know, there's something to be said for that. It, you know, it, it really is funny with the way that they're presenting Shinsuke Nakamura. He's speaking in a different language, one that 99% of us don't understand. But funnily enough, or ironically, we're paying more attention to Shinsuke Nakamura's promos than probably most guys on the roster because it's unique in their approach of finally deciding to let Shinsuke speak, even though they felt that, Oh, well he can't communicate Well, they found a way and it's very effective. And it's been not just effective in the, in the, in the subtitles, but the content of his promos and his mannerisms, his mannerisms while he speaks, even if you don't understand the words, you understand what he's trying to convey. And it's just great. And this time we got Seth coming out and he told the crowd that they should sing his song, which I got to say, I'm getting a little sick of. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm kind of over Seth Rollins song. Kind of done with it. You know, unless you're of course intending in person and then, you know, it's, it's fun to participate, but for at home, aren't we done? <laughs> Can we be done with this? Something tells me we're not even close, but he told the crowd that they're beautiful and he loves them, and Rollins said Shinsuke Nakamura has been ducking him and playing games, and that if Mur- Nakamura didn't, doesn't accept his rematch offer, then he was pulling the opportunity, and that there are a million capable and deserving challengers in the locker room, and he's looking for a fight, and that this is Nakamura's last chance. I have no problem with Seth Rollins telling Nakamura this is your last chance, but I would have liked this if it wasn't Rollins, the champion, trying to force a challenger to have a title match. It should have been Rollins just trying to have a match with Shinsuke and the title would have been the bargaining chip that Shinsuke uses to get the match. I think that's the way they should have played it instead of it kind of devalues the belt a little bit because the champion is trying to force a challenger to take a title match. No, that's completely backwards. I don't like it. I know that it's kind of just like a, it's pushing the fighting champion uh, narrative or I guess their idea of what a baby face should always be a fighting champion, which is again, nauseating at to say the least, but this is pushing it to the extreme version of that, which is forcing people to take title opportunities, which actually should never even be something that happens because shouldn't anyone take a title opportunity at any time. And, you know, it shouldn't be the title holder who's trying to force those championship matches to happen. If, if this title is in such high demand and we're told that it says such high value, wouldn't everyone be chomping at the bit to get it? There should never be a scenario ever in which a title opportunity has to be forced upon a challenger ever in any scenario. This it's just inexcusable. I don't care if it's Seth Rollins. I don't care who you are. 
It's inexcusable because I think it devalues the, the belt itself. It should have just been Seth trying to get revenge by having a match. And then the title would have been something that Shinsuke said, fine, you know, I'll fight you, but you're putting your, you know, your life's work on the line. You're putting your title on the line. And Seth would have just, you know, of course he just would have agreed. That wouldn't even have been a problem because he's the baby face champion. So I just don't like that part of it. However, that's the only complaint I have because Shinsuke Nakamura challenged Seth to a match at, you guessed it, Fastlane in a last man standing match. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. I have no issues whatsoever. And this time around, you know, we kind of know what to expect with Seth and Shinsuke. And I almost don't want it to end. You know, I have a sneaking suspicion it's probably going to end at the uh, payback. Or I keep saying payback. Fast lane. I don't know. I'm getting payback and fast lane mixed up because it's like a one word event. And payback and fast lane have the same number of syllables, I feel like, too. And I don't know if they've ever been back to back. So fast lane. I, you know, th- that's their second uh, matchup here. And I'm, I don't know if they have plans for Seth at Crown Jewel at the beginning of November in Saudi Arabia. If they don't, they could stretch this to a third match. They could. But I don't know if they will. If they have ideas of a bigger match uh, you know, down the line for Seth. I just hope that when this is all over for Shinsuke, that Shinsuke gets the credit he deserves. And as I've said weeks and weeks now, I just am concerned that Shinsuke goes back into mid-card hell. I, I just... You know, that, that concerns me because we've seen what the, he's capable of now. We've seen that, uh, you know, he's he can cut promos even if he doesn't speak the native tongue. And it's it's a lot of fun. My God, is it fun? So uh, Nakamura, of course, threatening that Rollins won't be able to walk again and bringing his family into it. All good stuff. Um, the, the one thing that Rollins did say is that Nakamura made a critical mistake. And that Nakamura thinks that his back being broken as a weakness because his daughter is going to be too ashamed to look at him. And Rollins said his broken back isn't a weakness. It's a strength. And he said the only way his family would be ashamed is if he doesn't give it everything he has. I think he had a bit of a missed opportunity here uh, that, you know, that that paragraph doesn't really resonate well with me. It doesn't have a, like a, a destination. It kind of just like goes all over the place and hits key words. But I think what he should have said is, you know, I think you, you made one critical mistake yeah, my back is injured, but being backed into a corner, what do wounded animals do, right? They turn even more vicious. They turn even more violent, more desperate to keep and hang on to what they have and to survive. So Shinsuke, you may target my back, but now I'm a wounded animal, right? That's, I think, that's what I was hoping for. And then he talks about this, like these weird kind of like, oh, my family, I'm going to get everything I have. I'm not making fun of the promo. It was fine. It was solid. Everything you always expect from Seth. But I just thought that that was where he was going about being a wounded animal and, uh, you know, making that analogy. He didn't, but what do I know? So let's see. Uh, After, well, I'm not going in any particular order. But we got Tegan Knox versus Natalia with Lynch on commentary. And the, the the stipulation of this match was whoever wins gets a title shot, the NXT title, um, at No Mercy, NXT No Mercy, on Saturday against Lynch. And Tegan Knox beat Natalia in just under three minutes. And it, it was okay. I mean, why Natalia is still in this program is kind of beyond me. It seems this probably was her swan song for this program anyway, not her career, but this this program, it's it's got to be it. Natalia is honestly the last person who should be involved in this. Not that she doesn't deserve it, but that's not what this Lynch title run is designed to be. It's designed to be building up new talent and helping new talent. And of course, Tegan Knox needs a lot of help right now. And we have Tiffany Stratton waiting for... Becky Lynch on uh, on NXT, which already happened tonight. I don't know what the results are. You guys can catch the NXT review show tomorrow with Memphis Mark. But uh, so th- that was good to me that Tegan Knox won. If Natalia had won, I, I mean, <laughs> I, that would have been just completely mind-boggling. But Tegan Knox and Becky Lynch, hey, cool. And, and honestly, I don't think much is going to come of this for Tegan Knox, other than just put on a bust-ass match. 
show people what you can do. This is a big stage for you compared to what you've, you know, uh, had thus far in your career and the matches you've had and the, and the, the, the lights that you've had shined on you are not going to be any brighter than they are, uh, uh, you know, than they will be on Saturday at, at no mercy. So this is an opportunity for Tegan Knox to put, make a name for herself because you hear the reaction from the crowd. It's basically non-existent. All right. Tommaso Ciampa versus Ludwig Kaiser. Really good. Uh, you know, I, I, I will say that these two wish, I wish they got more time and they're both just polished wrestlers. Ciampa who has been just, I, I mean, I gotta say I, I, Ciampa is a bizarre call up, not in the sense that he didn't and couldn't handle it. Just the creative direction of Ciampa has been so erratic. You'd need a scorecard to keep track. I have no idea who and what Tommaso Ciampa is yet. I still don't. I still don't have confidence in who he is because I have seen a massive lack of consistency in is he heel, is he face, uh, who and what is he. The, you know th- That's been very concerning to me. So perhaps... You know, with this uh, with this matchup, uh, him winning against Kaiser and putting on a really nice show, and also the title match he's going to have against Gunther, will put him on the map, give him some solid you know, something to sink his teeth into, give him a promo to actually cut, and then see where he goes from there. I, I don't think he'll beat Gunther. I, I I don't think he will, and I say that because. I told you once Gunther passed the honky tonk man's IC title record after that, anything's up for grabs. He could lose it at any time to anybody, not literally anybody, but everyone that competes against him for the title post beating that record of the honky tonk man will have a more significant and more significant chance of winning the belt as we go forward. Uh, which will be a good thing for Gunther only because I think that'll be a sign that they're about to move him into onto the next level of world title and uh, you know, bigger and better things. But I don't think they're quite there yet with Gunther. So I think he has a little bit longer. Um, I mean, we know Seth Rollins and Gunther is happening, by the way. I mean, that's that's got to happen. So, uh, all right. Let's continue on here. We did get Bronson Reed versus Otis in a four minute match, actually longer than I thought they'd give them. And Bronson Reed beats Otis. So, um, the, the finish of this was Otis going for a Vader bomb. Reed avoided it. And then Reed, uh, followed up with a senton splash, hit his tsunami and got the victory. Uh, the right person won, I guess. Um, I mean, I say that because Bronson Reed's also been kind of inconsistent as of late, but him beating Otis, it, it was a fun match for what you thought it would be. Two guys that have the exact same body types. I mean, I mean, just like to a T. Uh, unbelievable. Two tree trunk men, uh, thick dudes who it's all about power. And this is what I'm talking about. These kinds of matches are needed. And all the flip-flop fly athleticism that most of the roster brings, it's nice to see a match that doesn't do that once in a while. And this is exactly what uh, I think was needed. It's about as good as it could have been. Honestly, and it's just good that they didn't hurt each other because both are super strong and uh, super heavy. So uh, that that's a positive. But Bronson Reed winning the right move. All right. Where are we going here? We're going to go to Dominic Mysterio versus Dragon Lee for the NXT North American Championship. This was a treat. I will say this. When you get the crowd to chant, this is awesome for a match in which Dom Mysterio is in, you know you've achieved something. Because of all for all the boos and genuine hatred that the fans have for Dom, and it's, I think, in, you know, genuine, which is rare these days, it is a hell of a testament and a feather in their cap to have Dominic Mysterio, who the fans despise, give compliments to during the match. Because this is awesome is a compliment to both men. And it was. Now, Dragon Lee had, I think, a as good of a, uh, a debut match on the main roster as you could hope for. Dominic Mysterio did his part. It's also nice to see, that, well, uh, with Dominic 
not losing here and beating Dragon Lee clean after his two-minute loss to Cody Rhodes last week. So that was a positive. Dominic doesn't always have to cheat to win and shouldn't look like he's a child that needs help all the time. But this was a really good match, and uh, I I hope that there's a rematch at some point. This was a lot of fun. Ten-minute match. Dom hitting the frog splash and getting the victory. Great. This was this was a lot of fun. And I you know, I will also say that every single masked wrestler post Rey Mysterio will forever have the shadow of Rey Mysterio over them. Forever. You know, I mean, think about the the, the men who have come past or post Rey Mysterio, any of the luchadors that have come into WWE that have not performed well, or we consciously or us or subconsciously compare them to Rey Mysterio and go, Oh, that kind of looks like Rey. Oh, but it's not. Or, well, Rey, Rey would have done that better. There's just that instant comparison that we have. That's unfairly attached to whoever comes in with a mask and the luchador style. And, it's just the way it's going to be because of how great Rey Mysterio was and still is, you know? So, but, uh, the, the dragon here had an, uh, as good of a debut on the main roster as you could have hoped for, as I said, and I wouldn't mind seeing these two lock up again. So, okay. We then get, um, Owens and Zane being interviewed and, of course, there's still that distrust about Jay, which is overtaking everybody. Uh, Nia Jax came out and she uh, joined him in the ring. In the ring, and Barrett said he was happy that Cole was in the line of fire rather than him. And Cole asked Jax why she's targeted everyone in the locker room, and Jax said she wasn't paying attention to him. Then told him to relax, and she said, "I'm Nia Jax. I'm the baddest human in all of WWE." And then she said, see, Michael, they thought it was going to be Rhea Ripley, the most dominant champion, male or female. I squashed her. Cole said they thought the same of Shayna Baszler, and she squashed her too. And then Jax listed the other wrestlers she squashed and said she would do the same to anyone they put the and put in the ring with her. And the crowd gave her the what treatment. Uh, Zoe Stark came in and interrupted Jax and uh, jumped over the top rope, went face-to-face with Jax and... Uh, Stark congratulated her for squashing her and said it, it you know, uh, she did it while her back was turned and then dared Jax to do it when they were face to face. She sub, she shoved Stark down and they fought while referees pulled them apart. So, um, that allowed, that led to a Jax versus Stark matchup where she defeated Nia Jax. That is beat Zoe Stark in just about three minutes. And, um, Jax followed up with the Annihilator sit-down splash from the middle rope that got the victory. So kind of a Yoko, uh, Yokozuna bomb, basically. And they're, you know, the creative's building her up as a monster. We know that. Jax is not good on promos. Almost ever. She's just not. She's got a, a very unique look. And uh, I think she's okay in the ring. I know that many people laugh about that, but let's be honest. WWE has a lot of assets and a lot of money tied up in the women's division and uh, big time money with some of these stars. And why would WWE knowingly put somebody in there that is a massive liability that could potentially hurt a uh, one of their assets and cost them a lot of money? Meaning, if Nia Jax was so bad, WWE would not put her in there. If they thought that there was like like a 50-50 chance that every match Nia Jax has, WWE, uh, or, or that she could injure that person, WWE would not take that chance. That's not good odds. So I think the over uh, estimation of Jax injuring people is a little unfair to her, but that's going to follow her forever. She can't wash that off no matter how much she tries. That's why I told uh, WWE last week, because I'm sure they listen is lean into this guys. They want to say that I'm injuring people and that I'm a bad wrestler. Let's lean into that. The fans have told you what they think you are. 
and you're not going to change their mind. So you might as well take what they think they have, flip it and own it and make money on it. I would triple quadruple down on that narrative of me being a bad wrestler and injuring people. I would, if I were Nia Jax and that character, because I'm sure that she you know, is angry and frustrated with the, the fans in real life for kind of creating this aura about her, uh, is turn it around, own it, and say, you know what? You know what? I may not be the most athletic woman here, but I'm the most dominant, and I'm not here to help build the next generation of talent. I'm here for me, and I'm here to hurt people. And you know, I'd wink and nod at the crowd, and I'd say, you guys know all about that, don't you? I mean, I would, I would lean into this. They've already given you something to chew on. Take it. Don't run, run from it. I think there's opportunity here. So, I continue to 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 uh, to, to uh, pound that drum. Okay, let's see. Uh, we got. The Miz coming out for a Miz TV segment, and that's, of course, when Drew, Drew McIntyre came out. And there's banter back and forth, which we already talked about with uh, Drew and um, you know Kofi coming out and uh, Miz, who was interrupting Drew, and Drew was telling Miz to shut up. And th- there was something interesting, too. Cole noted that uh, Drew McIntyre has been short with people, meaning he's got more of a temper lately, too. So they're definitely, you know, excuse me, building this narrative of Drew kind of slowly changing and, you know, he's changing who he is, which I don't, I don't, I don't dislike other than just who they're choosing to, uh, to, to use with Drew right now to to help change him. Now the, the, uh, the uh, whole lovely new day with their jokes about calling Drew McIntyre big D and you knew where that was going. It's like these two men, are stuck in 2014 when the group was formed. I mean, this group is literally going on 10 years old. It's unbelievable. And they've been doing the same thing almost that entire time. It's a travesty. Again, I blame the fans for not turning on this act and how the trombone is still a thing. also is a travesty of epic proportions, but they try to make a joke about it with the big D. We all know the, when you all know what they're referencing. Of course, Kingston said McIntyre should have helped Jay. I'd love to hear why, but Miz tried to speak and McIntyre told him to sh- McIntyre told him to shut up again. And Kingston said they look up to McIntyre because he always does what's right and they respect him for it. Why is helping out Jay Uso who tried to screw you out of a belt the right thing to do? Explain that to me. Yeah, I don't know. <sighs> um. Anyway, moving on. We already talked about Drew and Kofi, and then we get to the main event here. We get Damian Priest and Finn Balor versus Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn for the undisputed tag team titles. This match went, what was it, like 20 minutes? Yeah, a little over 20 minutes, where Damian Priest and Finn Balor defeated KO and Sami. Again, expected. There's no need to put the belts on Kevin and Sami right now. I like them actually without the belts, strangely enough. The Judgment Day are benefiting from it more than Kevin and Sammy could at this point. And uh, J.D. McDonough is the X Factor here who screwed up things at the beginning of Raw. We'll talk about Cody in a minute. I'm saving that for last. And trying to make good on it here by hitting Sammy in the head with a title belt. And let me just say this. I like J.D. McDonough in this role. I think that he brings a little bit of a smarmy heel who he, he has a face that you just want to punch. I have to say it. I'm sorry. Just, he, he just looks like a, just a jerk. Uh, he looks like he has little man syndrome. And as a, as a guy, that's not exactly a tall guy. I can say this. Okay. But, uh, also the title shots to the head. I'll take it. When was the last time we saw title belts to the head? When they're done right and safely, let's go. I'm all for it. We, I feel like that's been a lost finish, a lost art for a long time or title belt shots to the head that end matches. So again, the right people won here. A really nice match that, uh, of course, Cody got out and, and involved in this and he tried to even the odds 
but to no avail. Um, and of course, as I said, Priest and Balor win. After the match, Priest and Balor, or rather, Priest and Dom met Balor and JD on the floor, while Cole wondered if McDonough had finally proven himself. Um, and then uh, we got a, I think, a stunner on Dom. I th- I'm pretty sure on that. So, anyway. No issues here with the finish of the match here. No no issues with the finish of having the Judgment Day retain the belts. They should. But let me talk about Cody Rhodes here, who opened Monday Night Raw. And he stopped and he greeted younger fans along the way, as he always does, because he is Mr. Politician. I mean, he is like a parody of himself at this point. And then Cole had a video package or set up a video package with Jay rejecting the Judgment Day invitation to join the faction last week. But Cody welcomed viewers to Raw, as I told you he would. And I'm not saying this to be smart or say, oh, see, I know everything. No, no, no. It's a, it's a, it's a massive thorn in my side. And I don't know how it's not bothering any of you. Maybe it is, but I don't hear from you. That every single person that opens their mouth, the very first thing out of their mouth is welcome to Monday Night Raw. Why? I don't know. But of course, Cody pulls the uh, company line here. And then he did exactly what I I also can't stand. And I mentioned this last night in the current state of WWE with Anthony and Marco. I really recommend you check that out. We went for nearly an hour on various topics. He said, oh, well, you know, excuse me to the folks at home while I turn my back and see the crowd behind me and see my friends behind me. Oh my God. It's just the worst. It's the worst. Do do you guys like being pandered to like that? Like children? Do you guys actually believe this is authentic? Do you not see a politician in this dude? I mean, let me, let me, I think I've decided that it's, it's not the person Cody Rhodes. It's not the talent Cody Rhodes. It's the character he's portraying, which I think actually bleeds into who he really is. Those are always the best characters. But this baby face Cody Rhodes, it's not Cody Rhodes the person. It's not Cody Rhodes the wrestler. It's not Cody Rhodes the promo. All of those, he's excellent. It's this character that's insufferable. And it continues to just be the worst of the worst. Uh, and I know that I, I'm completely outnumbered because of reaction and, and all that. I just I don't understand somebody that can like likes being pandered to and talked to like a child. That's what he does. And then tries to win you over with quote unquote being responsible for bringing Jay Uso in, however the hell that happens all of a sudden that he can you know maneuver massive trays between Raw and SmackDown and then get his nose in everything that he needs to to to, to elicit a positive reaction. It's, 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 it's awful, uh, but let me move on. Um, God. So Cody said he's tried to broach the subject. There's another word that he doesn't need to use. It, th- th- this is now, now we know what he's saying, but Mr. You know, Mr. Thesaurus over here, it's like he's reading his promo before he goes out there uh, in collaboration with creative. However, it's developed. And he's looking at it and going, Hmm. You know what word is just too plain and ordinary for my the suit I'm gonna wear tonight? Uh, I'm, instead of saying discuss, I'm gonna say broach. Hmm. You know what? That that sounds tasty to me. Uh, yeah. But that is, that's how I feel like it is. He just kind of picks and chooses words that instead of using language that is just plain and straight to the point. He has to use these elevated words to make sure we are aware of how highly intelligent he is. It's obnoxious. Cole's, or rather, Cody said Jay coming to Raw means that somebody will be, quote, drafted over to SmackDown and said that this means there's a disgruntled locker room that thinks he should have Jay let Jay sink. And Cody said that's not him. He said that he and Jay are not best friends and perhaps there are other reasons he would want him on Raw, and he says that something tells me we're not in the third inning anymore, anymore, boys. Um, what? I, I think 
Based on this analysis, that was a play on Heyman stating that they're in the third inning of the Bloodline saga when asked about it in a post-show press conference. So I think that's what it is. I had to actually see this in, in text in someone's analysis. So I didn't see that, uh, that, that post-show press conference with Paul Heyman. But if we're only in the third inning of the Bloodline story, you guys know how many innings are in baseball, right? That means we're only a third of the way through the Bloodline story. Take that for what it's worth, good or bad. Um, but Cody brought up Jay turning down Judgment Day and started to refer to it as the most toxic faction in history. And then he was interrupted by the group's entrance and uh, Dom tried to speak as always, gets booed. And uh, Dom spoke in Spanish. They kept booing him. Of course, that, that whole game keeps getting played over and over. Dom tries to speak boo, boo, boo. Cody said that he, if he was game, if they wanted to enter the ring, and Cody noted that they all had title matches and asked what would happen when Rhea returns and they are empty-handed. And Dom told Cody to shut his mouth, and that's when Jay came in to fight by Cody's side. And then uh, we got J.D. McDonough, who was countered by Kevin and Sammy. So it would have been a four-on-three situation. And they thought better of it until, of course, we got uh, J.D. McDonough, who uh, kind of triggered the whole thing. And, hey, it was one of those things where Priest ended up getting his ass kicked because of J.D. McDonough. And then that allowed Priest to get angry at J.D. later in the night. And then J.D. tried to make good on it at the end of the night. So we'll, we, we will see. All right. Well, um, that I think covers Monday Night Raw. And, you know, overall, I thought it was a good show. Set up a ma- massive match for the, the Fastlane event, which is coming to us October 7th. So a week from Saturday, we'll be joining you and all the other patrons, of course, on the Discord server for the uh, Fastlane event. And if you guys want to go ad-free, I'm telling you you guys, and I know we post a lot of ads on here, great way to do it is patreon.com slash WWE podcast. You get to get in the door for a dollar. You get Discord, everything ad-free. You don't get the exclusive show of After Dark, and you don't get video updates. So I'll be posting another video update. I'm trying to do it one to two times a week. I'll be posting another one probably tomorrow. If I can, I might do it at work or something. <laughs> um, and that is only for the SmackDowns here and above. And um, you know, also, if you are interested, if you're an NXT level, I know there's a lot of you in the NXT level, the entry level, and you want to hear the After Dark, I do allow you to purchase them. So that is something that is available to you on the uh, on the purchasing side of things that, that uh, Patreon has allowed me to do. Obviously, it's totally up to you. Uh, but it is available for three dollars per show. So at that rate, right? And that's actually the lowest price that I could offer on Patreon. Patreon would not let me go any lower than that. But I think that's a fair price, considering that you know if you wanted to upgrade, you could do it, and it would actually be cheaper maybe to upgrade on a monthly basis than to purchase the shows. So take a look at that if you're interested. Of course, it's all optional. If, if you know, and most of you listen for free, and I appreciate everyone who listens and takes the time. A lot of options for wrestling podcasts out there, guys. A lot, too many, too many. It's a crowded space, no doubt about it. So, all right, well, that's going to do it for me, guys. Tomorrow, I'll be back with the mailbag. So, send in your letters, uh, not handwritten, please, email to mailbag at wwepodcast.com. And those of you who are patrons, please put in the subject line that you are a patron. So, just put like, you know, big caps, patron, patron email, patron mailbag, whatever you want to say, so I can prioritize your emails at the front of the show. And uh, we'll be able to answer that and get your phone calls in as well. That phone number is available in all of the show notes of the mailbag every week. So that'll do it for me, everybody. Thanks so much for listening. As always, take care. I'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash wwepodcast. Until then, we'll see you 
next time. <laughs>